In 2019, China quietly became the first nation to land on the far side of the moon. By 2020, their Chang'e program had already returned fresh lunar samples with no failures and no headlines. But a leaked internal file just blew open a secret. Their permanent moon base is not coming in 2035. It is racing toward completion in 2028. And while NASA publicly sets targets, China is already testing 3D printing technology and recycling systems so efficient they defy expectations. If these claims hold, the new moon race may be over before most people ever realized it started. So what exactly is China building? And why is the world's top space agency just now scrambling to catch up? China's lunar program has moved with a precision and consistency that stands out in the history of space exploration. Since the launch of Chang'e 1 in 2007, every mission in the Chang'e series has succeeded, with no catastrophic losses and no public setbacks. In 2019, Chang'e 4 achieved the first ever soft landing on the far side of the moon, a feat that had eluded every other space agency. Just a year later, Chang'e 5 5 brought back nearly 2 kilograms of lunar soil and rock, marking the first lunar sample return since the Soviet Union's Luna 24 in 1976. Each step has come faster than the last. While the United States took 8 years to move from its first satellite to landing astronauts on the lunar surface, China reached the far side in just 12 years from its own first satellite. The pace has not slowed. Chang'e 6 launched in 2024 to collect samples from the South Pole Aitken Basin, and Chang'e 7 is already scheduled to search for water ice at the lunar South Pole. The record is clear. Six missions launched, six missions successful. No other nation has landed on the moon in this century. China has done it multiple times, each time pushing further, gathering more data, and building towards something bigger. This track record is not just about national pride, it is about demonstrating the technical capacity to set ambitious goals and deliver, quietly and without fanfare, while the rest of the world debates and delays. A single slide, stamped with the official China National Space Administration logo and lines in Chinese and English, has sent shockwaves through the space policy world. The document, first referenced by the South China Morning Post and later traced to a United Nations presentation in Vienna, lays out a timeline that upends everything previously stated by Chinese officials. In bold, the year 2028 appears next to the words ILRS basic model. Chang'e A. Good launch. This is not a rumor or a grainy photo from a chat room. The slide's metadata matches China National Space Administration standard formats, with embedded watermarks and bilingual overlays used in international briefings. The signature at the bottom belongs to Wu Yanhua, the chief architect of China's lunar program. What is buried in the fine print is even more startling. Under the 2028 milestone, a line reads, Experimental Verification of Lunar Resource Utilization. For insiders, that phrase is code for on-site construction, using local materials, essentially building with moon dust. Multiple Chinese science conference reports and tender notices from the same period confirm that Chang'e 8 is not just another probe. It is the first mission explicitly tasked with testing lunar construction technology. The implications are enormous. China's moon base is not a distant dream for the 2030s. The infrastructure phase could begin in just four years, years ahead of public statements. The timeline is no longer theoretical. Official artifacts presented on the world stage spell out the acceleration. For the first time, the world has a concrete date and it is much sooner than anyone outside Beijing expected. Inside the laboratories of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, scientists point to numbers that sound almost unbelievable. Their latest published results claim a 94% yield in lunar regolith construction tests, meaning nearly all the simulated moon dust processed in the lab can be turned into solid building blocks. On paper, that is a game changer. But these figures come from tightly controlled environments using carefully prepared lunar simulant, not the unpredictable soil of the actual South Pole. The same scrutiny surrounds China's closed-loop habitat program. In the Yuegong facility, volunteers spent 370 days sealed off from the outside world, 
recycling air, water, and waste at a reported efficiency of 98%. That level of self-sufficiency would be revolutionary for a moon base. Yet outside peer review is limited, and no international team has been allowed to independently audit the data. Remote sensing technology faces its own obstacles. The Kuekiao-2 satellite ground-penetrating radar operates at 100 MHz and 500 MHz, and it promises to map ice deposits up to 80 meters below the lunar surface. But the reality is more complex. The depth and clarity of each scan depend on local regolith composition, and even the best passes need to be repeated three times, five times, and sometimes ten times to confirm a promising signal. Orbital radar can highlight anomalies, but only a lander or a drill can prove what is really hidden beneath the surface. For all the bold claims in technical papers and press releases, the leap from laboratory to lunar reality is still unproven. The numbers are impressive, but the real test will come when these systems leave the lab and face the moon's extremes. At the core of China's lunar push are machines built for speed and endurance. The Long March 9th booster, still in prototype, has already fired all 30 of its engines in a synchronized static test, producing thrust on a scale rivaling Saturn V. Engineers measured a 12-second burn without a single fault, clearing the way for heavy lunar payloads. For power, Chinese designers have adapted the ACPR-50S small modular reactor. On paper, it is capable of generating 10 megawatts, enough to keep an entire outpost running through the two-week lunar night. The reactor's shielding and cooling systems have been redesigned for the moon's vacuum, with radiators that unfold like wings and can shed heat even when temperatures plummet to minus 170 degrees Celsius. Robotics teams have taken a different approach than NASA. Instead of a handful of complex machines, China is deploying swarms, hundreds of autonomous construction bots, each programmed with simple instructions but able to coordinate in real time. These robots are designed to work in darkness, powered by the base's nuclear grid laying bricks and assembling modules while the surface is too cold for humans. Navigation is not left to chance. China's lunar GPS, a trio of satellites in polar orbit, provides meter-level positioning anywhere on the surface. Hardware for Chang'e 7 and Chang'e 8 is being integrated side by side at Wenchang, signaling a dual launch cadence and orbiting above. Tiangong 4 continues to serve as a test bed for closed loop life support, simulating every system that will keep the first lunar residents alive. Shackleton Crater stands at the heart of China's lunar ambitions, not just for its dramatic rim, but for what lies beneath and around it. The peaks surrounding this ancient impact site receive sunlight nearly year-round, up to 90% of the lunar day, offering a stable energy supply that no other location on the moon can match. Deep inside the permanently shadowed regions, radar surveys and orbital studies point to massive reserves of water ice, perhaps as much as 100 million tons. This combination, almost continuous solar power and vast water resources, forms the backbone of China's lunar-based strategy. But China is not acting alone. Seventeen nations have signed on to the International Lunar Research Station Agreement. Russia brings nuclear reactor technology, drawing on decades of experience in space power. Pakistan supplies rare Earth elements vital for advanced electronics and robotics. The United Arab Emirates has pledged $10 billion to the project, while Saudi Arabia and Venezuela add capital and uranium. Each partner is promised a stake in the base and, crucially, in the resources it taps. In this new coalition, the old rules of the space race no longer apply. It is not just about planting a flag, but about securing territory and resources that could shape the next century. The first nation or alliance to establish a permanent foothold at Shackleton will control access to the moon's most valuable assets, setting the terms for everyone who follows. NASA's leadership found themselves under intense scrutiny as news of China's compressed timeline reached Washington. Congressional hearings grew urgent, with lawmakers pressing agency heads for answers and accountability. The official appropriations record shows a steady increase in NASA's budget, but not the no windfall some headlines suggest. Instead, the latest budget requests reflect a mounting sense of urgency, with lunar exploration and Artemis priorities singled out for accelerated funding and oversight. 
In closed-door sessions, senior officials reviewed internal risk assessments. The phrase strategic disadvantage appeared repeatedly in briefing materials, echoing the language of recent public testimony. Policy experts and outside auditors were brought in to map the credibility of every claim, color-coding evidence by source, green for confirmed public records, amber for partial or indirect sourcing, red for unverified or speculative reports. A panel of former astronauts, lunar scientists, and space policy analysts reviewed the full ledger, mission manifests, procurement notices, international agreements, and technical papers, cross-referencing each against the documentary's claims. The results, compiled in a public evidence pack, are available for anyone to audit. This transparent approach, combining expert review with open documentation, sets a new standard for how high-stakes space reporting is conducted and signals that the stakes of the new lunar race are matched by a demand for clarity and truth. Right now, the race for the moon isn't just about science, it's about who sets the rules for a new world. As China accelerates, every delay reshapes global power. The next decade won't just define space, it could decide who owns the future beyond Earth.